Hey everyone, it's Dr. Marcon. We're continuing on with part two of chapter 12. We're gonna go into the gross anatomy of the nervous system. So let's talk about nerves. Nerves are cable-like organs in the peripheral nervous system. Nerves are basically axons, numerous axons wrapped in connective tissue. Most nerves contain myelinated and non-myelinated sensory and motor axons. And we know that in the peripheral nervous system, an axon is surrounded by Schwann cells. So peripheral nervous system, Schwann cells, central nervous system, oligodendrocytes. These are the different layers of the nerves, much like the layers of the muscles and the muscle fascicles. So the innermost layer is the endoneurium, endo meaning within. So endoneurium, this is the layer of delicate connective tissue that surrounds the axon, okay? Next is the perineurium. Perineurium is the connective tissue wrapping surrounding a nerve fascicle. Now nerve fascicles are a group of axons bound into bundles. And the outermost layer surrounding all these fascicles is the epineurium. So epi being the outermost layer, epineurium, the whole nerve is surrounded by a tough fibrous sheath. So the next slide shows you the different uh, layers. So we have one axon here and uh, with its myelin sheath made up of Schwann cells surrounding the axon and the connective tissue covering of the axon and the Schwann cells, that is the endoneurium. Okay, and you can see these uh, axons within the uh, f within the fascicle. So a whole fascicle, this whole circle right here, the the connective tissue surrounding the fascicle is epineurium. I'm sorry, not epineurium, perineurium. So perineurium is the connective tissue that surrounds the fascicle, and then you have a bunch of fascicles that make up the nerve. So uh, the nerve is surrounded by the outermost connective tissue, which is the epineurium, okay? So the epineurium surrounding the fascicle or the bunch of fascicles. So again, innermost is the endoneurium, which um, surrounds uh, a single axon and myelinated sheath. Um, and then the perineurium surrounding uh, the fascicle and then a bunch of fascicles make up the nerve which is surrounded by the outermost covering of connective tissue or which is the epineurium. So within the central nervous system we have gray and white matter. Gray matter is the gray colored um, stuff, substance um, within the central nervous system. It surrounds the hollow central cavities of the central nervous system, forms an S-shaped region or H-shaped region in the spinal cord. Now the dorsal half contains the cell bodies of interneurons and the ventral half contains the cell bodies of motor neurons. So the ventral horn will contain those um, motor multipolar neurons that we saw in the beginning of the semester in the histo slides. So gray matter is composed primarily of neuronal cell bodies, dendrites, and non-myelinated axons. It surrounds the white matter of the central nervous system in the cerebral cortex and the cerebellum. Now in the central nervous system, we have white matter that lies external to the gray matter of the central nervous system. It's composed of myelinated axons, uh, and then also consists of axons passing between specific regions of the central nervous system. Within the white matter, we have tracks. So tracks are bundles of axons traveling to similar destinations and to similar areas uh, within the brain. So here in the spinal cord, if we see, look at a cross section of the spinal cord, we have that inner gray matter here. Um, and then it has that H shape within the spinal cord. And here um, is the central cavity or central canal. So we know that the ventral horns 
here. The ventral horns of the spinal cord contain our motor or multipolar neurons that we saw in the beginning of the semester. Okay. Um, so gray matter, again, has short non-myelinated interneurons, as well as cell bodies of interneurons and motor neurons, as well as the neuroglia. Surrounding the gray matter within the spinal cord, we have white matter. Uh, white matter contains the, the tracks, the fiber tracks of myelinated and non-myelinated axons, as well as neuroglia. Okay. So we can see that there are different uh, nerves um, coming off of the spinal cord. We have um, a dorsal nerve. I know that this is dorsal because here is a dorsal root ganglion, and the ganglion are only found in the dorsal nerves, okay? And then here is the ventral nerves. The ventral nerves contain the motor or efferent fibers, whereas the dorsal nerves contain the sensory or afferent fibers. So these fibers going up towards the central nervous system, these motor efferent fibers coming from or going down the spinal cord to the effector organs. So the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system are functionally interrelated. Uh, the nerves of the peripheral nervous system um, contain either afferent or efferent fibers. Afferent, again, being the sensory going towards the central nerf nervous system. So afferent peripheral nervous system fibers respond to sensory stimuli. So the sensory stimuli will go up these afferent fibers towards the central nervous system to the integration center within, within the uh, central nervous system. And then the efferent or motor peripheral nervous system fibers will transmit motor stimuli uh, from the central nervous system to the effector muscles um, and or glands. Now nerves of the central nervous system are composed um, uh, of interneurons that receive the sensory information from the peripheral nervous system. They also direct and transport information to, spe to specific central nervous system regions. Uh, and we'll talk about the regions in, in a bit. Um, also, uh, within the integration center, they initiate appropriate motor responses. So, for example, you put your hand on a hot stove. The stimulus of the heat from the stove will travel up the sensory afferent fibers of the peripheral nervous system to the brain or to the central nervous system where it processes and says, ouch, it's hot. And then the integration centers will tell the motor part of your brain to send the stimuli or send the signal down the efferent motor fibers to your hand, taking your hand away from the hot stove. Now reflex arcs are simple chains of neurons. Uh, help explain reflex behaviors and also determine the structural plan of the nervous system. Um, reflex arcs are responsible for our reflexes. Um, these are rapid autonomic motor responses, can be either visceral or somatic. So there are five components of a reflex arc. First, you have the receptor. This is the site where the stimulus acts. Um, for example, when we do our patellar reflex, um, if you ever get to have an instructor that brings in a reflex hammer, um, the reflex hammer will tap the patellar tendon. So the receptor being the patellar tendon, that's the site where the stimulus acts. The sensory neuron, the afferent uh, neuron will transmit afferent impulses to the CNS. Um, then it will hit the integration center, which will consists of one or more synapses in the central nervous system. So from the integration center, where this information is processed, it will then um, provide appropriate motor response. So the motor neuron will then conduct efferent impulses from the integration center to an infector uh, muscle or gland. And again, the muscle, the effector is either a muscle or gland, which will respond 
to the efferent impulses coming from the CNS and will either contract a muscle or secrete hormones um, or whatever secretions from the glands. So here are the five components of the reflex arc. You have your receptor. A receptor can be, you know, um, a receptor within the skin. You then have your sensory neuron um, with its uh, afferent fibers going towards the spinal cord, and then it'll go to the integration center within the CNS. Um, from there, the CNS will uh, provide a stimulus or a motor um, signal going down the efferent uh, motor neuron fiber to the effector being either a muscle or a gland. So a monosynaptic reflex is the simplest of all reflexes. It only has one synapse. Uh, this is the fastest of all reflexes. So for example, we have the knee-jerk reflex, which is elicited by the patellar uh, reflex with, a, with a, a reflex hammer. So you can see that the reflex hammer will tap the patellar tendon. This will cause um, a reaction or a um, signal to the sensory or stretch receptor uh, within the anterior leg muscle. And then from there, the stimulus will go up the sensory afferent neuron um, to the integration center within the spinal cord here. Um, and then from there, or within the CNS, and then from there, it will elicit a response, a motor response, uh, and travel down the motor efferent neuron fiber to the effective uh, effector organ being the muscle within the anterior part of your thigh, which then will cause extension of the leg at the knee. A polysynaptic reflex, as its name implies, means that there is more than one synapse. So this is a more common type of reflex in which you have one or more interneurons that are part of the pathway. Example of this is a withdrawal reflex, like um, the reflex that I told you before when uh, your hand feels something hot or something sharp. Uh, the interneurons will signal the motor neuron to contract the muscle involved. So here we see a finger touching a sharp tack, and we can see the signal going uh, from the sensory receptor to, um, up the sensor, sensory afferent uh, neuron fiber to the uh, interneuron uh, within the CNS. And from there, the motor signal will go down the motor efferent neuron um, and then towards the um, effector organ. Here we have two synapses within uh, the integration center. So this would be your polysynaptic withdrawal reflex. Now, with regards to neuronal circuits, uh, I'm not going to get into too much uh, detail about this. Just know that they exist. Um, we have different types of circuits. Circuits. We have diverging circuits where one presynaptic neuron will synapse with several other neurons. Uh, this is what's called divergence. And then we have converging circuits where many neurons uh, will synapse on a single postsynaptic neuron. This is what's called uh, convergence. And then we have a reverberating circuit. This is a circuit that receives feedback via a collateral axon from a neuron in the circuit. So this actually shows you the different types of circuits. So we have uh, the diverging circuit where you have one uh, neuron and uh, the signal is transmitted to many outputs. You have a converging circuit where many uh, presynaptic neurons will converge on one postsynaptic neuron. And then you have a reverberating circuit where you have um, input which travels down the neurons and then you'll have a collateral uh, neuron which will um, bring the signal back to these other neurons.